Right. So uh, the session will be recorded and you will all be sent a link to the recording of the meeting. Um, let me begin the introduction again. Um, the two speakers today are Claire Lemanak and Tanya Paquet from the University of Cape Town and they're going to be talking about transforming hits into leads. Uh, and they're going to illustrate this with work from two mal malaria drug discovery case studies. Um, and I will turn the floor over to them. I wonder if the mouse will work. Exit. Right. Okay. Over to you, Claire and Tanya. I can see your screen. Um, excellent, thank you, Caroline. Um, so I hope the the presentation went onto full screen now. Yes. Should be fantastic. Right. So good day, everybody. Um, today, Claire and I would just like to take you through uh, some of the malaria drug discovery work we've been working on. Um, a few years ago, all the work we're going to cover today is published, and you'll see some references at the bottom of each slide, um, which you are free to go have a look at um, if you maybe want to follow up on some more detail of, of what we'll be talking about. Um, so today we're going to try to focus on um, hits, going from hits to leads, um, pretty much also looking at where our heads came from and some thoughts we had around malaria and how to actually progress those heads into leads and then um, further along the pipeline. So for a start, um, as an overview, um, one thing that we find very important um, in looking at malaria and in terms of a malaria project is to um, set ourselves some goals. So um, to progress something obviously from start to finish, you need to kind of need to know what your end point needs to look like. Um, so for us, we would um, we would like to get a treatment of uncomplicated plasmodium falciparum malaria firstly, um, and then also obviously with the potential to treat plasmodium vivax malaria. Um, in this day and age, obviously it would be really critical to have a compound that would not be cross resistant to current drugs in the clinic. Um, and additionally, and this would become a bit more apparent as we go through the talk, um, if we can get some chemoprotective and or transmission blocking activity from the compounds we're working on, that would be a big plus for us. Um, so in terms of where we wanted to head with this project, it's a sort of in a nutshell um, where we wanted to go. So for today, we'll then take you through um, where our hits for this project came from um, and how we thought about a screening cascade to help us with this lead optimization that we wanted to do. And um, we would like to illustrate that in the hand of two case studies, um, this is compounds around two different scaffolds. First of all, the midazopyridazines, um, which is what Claire would talk about. And then secondly, um, a class of amino pyridines, um, which transformed into pyrazines, um, which um, I would later on in the session take you through. So I think if we can organize the session so that maybe if we talk about the first case study and then we'll allow some time for, for, for questions and follow up and some discussion, so we'll continue into the, into the next series. Right, so um, for the start of the program, where, where did our hits come from? Where did we find our starting points to actually optimize um, towards this goal of ours to get a treatment for malaria? Um, well, um, they, um, we managed to obtain a big biofocus library that was screened at the Skytis Institute. Um, and here we decided with our aim to have something that would not be cross-resistant, that from the screening already, we need to get an idea of whether these compounds are going to be resistant to uh, multi-drug resistant strains. So with our screening, we screened it both against drug sensitive and multi-drug resistant strains um, yeah, to, to get an early judgment on that and to help us pick the correct series that would steer us um, towards our end goal right from the start. Um, so with this big screening of about 36,000 compounds, um, there were classes of compounds identified um, that spanned several series. Um, uh, what we also did was look at cytotoxicity. Obviously, if you look at hits, um, you need to know that the activity you observe 
um, is truly against the parasite and not just general killing of the parasite due to um, some cytotoxicity. So it was very important that we also cross screen against the mammalian cell line um, to make sure that we already in our screening um, have a good margin between activity and cytotoxicity. So for, for those of you not familiar with the BioFocus library, um, the BioFocus library um, is, a, is a big collection of compound um, series, actually, where each series have about maybe, I think in our library it was something around 100 to 300 compounds with derivatives around a common scaffold. Um, and this is um, exemplified by all the different scaffold classes you can see in the boxes below. Um, and what we also indicate is some of the hit rates that we found for these classes. So typically what we looked at was um, compounds that would at around 2 micromolar inhibit growth of the parasite by greater than 80%. Um, and then what you can also see is, is sort of what sort of hits we got if we lower that to about greater than 50%. Um, and these four sort of classes of compounds um, stood out for us in this big screen. Um, so what we will go through today is actually the last two in the boxes that you can see highlighted. We called it the SFK52 and the SFK40 series of compounds. So already from the start, um, you could detect um, roughly a bit of a SAR, a structure activity relationship around these from the HIT data already, um, which can help you uh, think about and, and form further, further progression of these series. Right, so the next thing to think about, obviously, is how to progress these compounds. Um, again, what I put on is just what our goal was, obviously, a treatment of malaria, having things that are not cross-resistant, and this additional um, requirement of ours, or, or what would be a really nice add-on, is if we can find something that um, would either be chemoprotective or transmission blocking. So in order to progress, obviously, from hit to lead and lead optimization, um, we need progression criteria, like a cascade and progression criteria and certain cutoffs that will enable us to make decisions along the way and, and optimize compounds from one stage to another. Um, so we defined um, our screening cascade um, initially and um, we decided to actually take a very quick path into proof of concept. Um, and this is mainly based on the fact that all our optimization is done um, on phenotypic screening as opposed to having a target-based program. So already with phenotypic screening, the compounds that you get that are active, you can make the assumption that these compounds should have a degree of permeability already inherent, inherent to the compound, else they would not have been able to cross the parasite's cell wall in a phenotypic assay and actually exert some activity. Um, but so. The main part that you see in the middle of that cascade going down is actually a very sort of a very quick path from um, getting phenotypic activity and making assumption about permeability um, and then seeing what these compounds would do in vivo in a mouse efficacy model. Um, alongside the central cascade, um, on each stage of, of the process, we do in parallel get additional data on the compounds. Um, that would collectively help us to um, decide between compounds um, if, if compounds look, look equally good for us. Um, and obviously, right at the end, um, we take the whole collection of data into account um, when we need to decide on eventually what compounds we need to take forward in, for instance, into in vivo tox toxicology models. So you will see on the second level of that, the screening cascade, um, for compounds that we prioritize to go in vivo, um, those compounds are also compounds that we would prioritize to go into the in vitro exoeritocytic um, life cycle stage assays. Um, and this is by virtue of um, basically the throughput of the assays and our accessibility to the assays. So although we would, you see, in our program like to have these trans like transmission blocking activity, um, when we think about our optimization and what is possible and what our first tier of assays would be, um, 
for us at that stage, um, we did not have the access to the assays to have that as our primary opti optimization criteria. Um, so what we use for our primary optimization, as you would also see in the following slide, is um, the activity against um, a drug sensitive, which is the NF54, and a, um, a drug resistant um, K1 strain of the malaria parasite. Right, so um, as all progression go, obviously, um, chemistry and biology is always in an interplay. Um, biology um, results coming back and forming um, what changes to make in a molecule um, and, and vice versa. And the cycle continues as we progress through the Phoenix Cascade, um, which is something we hope, um, and the thought process around that, and it's something we hope to, to illustrate further in this presentation. But so just something a bit more about, um, obviously, why we would like that additional chemoprotection and transmission blocking activity um, globally with the whole strategy to eradicate malaria um, it became more prominent and more important to actually block um, the liver stages and the sexual blood stages of the malaria parasite so you can see transmission to man um, for malaria um, it's very much dependent on um, on the liver stage and the ability of the for the parasite to um, develop and progress through the liver stage into the blood stage. Um, blood stage remain important even though you think about eradication strategy um, because the parasite load in the blood is what gives patients um, the clinical symptoms and um, being patient focused you would also and always want to relieve that clinical symptoms um, and then again thinking back against to transmission to the mosquito um, the sexual male and female gamete stages of the of the malaria parasite. Um, if you can block those from forming, um, you would be able to block transmission from man back to the mosquito and block and block the cycle. Um, so um, this is also the different malaria life cycle stages that um, through yeah through the medicines for malaria venture we were able to access to um, assess whether our compounds would be able to, to have that chemoprotectin and transmission blocking. Um, so we will hear a bit about that further, further in the presentation. So that was just as a bit of background, and I will hand over to Claire now to take you through how we looked at the imidopyrazine series um, and how we conducted some optimization around that. Thanks, Tanya. Good day, everyone. So. Um, as Tanya mentioned earlier, uh, from the biofocus uh, screening of the soft focus kinase library, we identified the SFK52 scaffolds with some uh, hits that were very active against um, the 3D7. Uh, we performed hit validation by resynthesizing uh, the hits and um, we tested them against NF54 and K1 in our facilities, and um, the three examples that are on the screen uh, appear to be quite potent with activities around or below 20 nanomolars. Um, so the advantages of these three hits were that they, they were very active they were no cytotoxic, but as you can see, um, they, um, they had clear metabolic soft spots and we needed to uh, improve the metabolic stability uh, on this type of compound. So from there, we started to focus on the SAR studies and we changed the substituent at the three and six positions. So the, the substituents that are listed on this slide are not exhaustive and there is a lot more that um, you can have a look at in the, in the paper that are, that are mentioned at the bottom of the slide. But uh, it's, it gives a good idea of, of the main results that we got for the SAR studies. And what you can see is that we obtained a very wide range of activities and um, some very clear SAR, SAR trends appeared. Um, so what we, can, um, what we can see is that at the sixth position, um, electron withdrawing group 
um, at the meta position of the of the of the phenyl ring um, were optimal for activity and um, group like sulfones, sulfon sulfonamides, and carboxamides were were the best. Um, we also learned that auto and para substituents were not tolerated at all for for activity and um, one of the groups that gave the best potency was the sulfonyl sulfon cyclopropyl sulfon sorry at the superposition and this one appeared to be 10 more potent than the sulfonyl metal that was already very potent um, at the three position we also um, we also saw that the electron withdrawing group at the para position were optimal and meta position here was tolerated. But again, the sulfonyl methyl seems to be one of the best compounds for activity. Um, one of the one result that was um, that was good for for this as we, that came up with this SAR study was that the compounds that were active and that are highlighted in green here had good microsomal stability compared to the original hits. And also there was no cross resistance uh, observed with K1 strain. So from there, we took the uh, sulfon methyl sub substituent at the three position for the for R1 and at the para position for R2 that gave good activity and we we continue by investigating the SR around the core. So what we did was uh, to vary the number of nitrogen and the position of the nitrogen around the core to see if we could find a scaffold that was giving us um, a better activity or better ANMI parameters. Um, what um, what we found was that the nitrogen at the two, seven, and eight position led to, to lot of activity, and that the pyrazolopyridines and pyrazolopyrimidines um, were very active scaffolds. So combining these results with the previous SAR results, um, we we continued um, to select compounds for further study, studies by taking the sulfonyl sacropropyl on the left hand side um, because we knew that it could boost activity and then we took the imidazopyridazine scaffold and the two pyrazolopyridine and pyrimidine scaffold uh, to continue for further investigation. Um, as you can see on the, on the right of the screen, uh, the reduced pyrazolopyrimidine scaffold was a bit less potent with only 63 uh, nanomolar activity, but we we were curious to see what the reduction of the core could could bring uh, as far as ANMI properties were were concerned. So we took also this one forward. So on this slide, um, we um, I pres um, you can see the. Um, the ADMI properties of the five compounds that were taken for, uh, forward for ADMI testing. So we we put these compounds through solubility and micro, microsomal stability assays, as well as HERG assay um, and cytotoxicity. So what is clear on this side is that all compounds were very active against both uh, NF54 and K1 strains with usually activities below 10 nanomolar except for um, the middle compound um, with the reduced pyrazolopyrimidine scaffold that was around 63. Um, none of the compounds were cytotoxic and stability was um, was good. What, what wasn't good was uh, solubility because none of the compound was soluble at physio physiological pH and also HERG appeared to be a recurrent issue except for the, the left the left side, no the right, sorry, the compound on the right side of the slide um, 674766. Um, you can also see that the imidazopyridazine 
uh, imidazolepiridazine compounds um, like 652103 on the left side um, at potential for in vivo efficacy with um, a reduction in parasitemia that was uh, very high at 4 times 50 in the Piberge model. Um, but um, the, for the other compounds, the good uh, in vitro efficacy didn't translate in vivo. So we had to find out um, why and if solubility could be um, an, an explanation, uh, it, it wouldn't be the, the only explanation. So we had to, to, to find out what, what was going on. So to do that, we had a look at the rat PK. And um, what we can see here is that there is a clear correlation on between um, P, uh, if, uh, in vivo efficacy in the PBRG model and uh, the bioavailability in the, in the rat PK. So for the first compound, the imidazopyridazine 103, uh, the bioavailability was really good and um, the half-life was also high and efficacy uh, therefore was good. Uh, while for the three compounds on the right hand side, um, for especially for the pyrazolopyrimidine and pyrazolopyridine, the bioavailability was extremely low, um, as low as one percent. So it's looking at this, it's not um, it's not a surprise that the in vivo efficacy wasn't good. For the one in the middle, we didn't do the red PK, but we had um, we had uh, the exposure from the in vivo efficacy study, and uh, we can see that um, Cmax was really low, and there was almost nothing that that went into into the the blood. So before I I continue on how we try to improve PK and uh, solubility, I just want to to stop here with the life cycle. Um, stages of the parasite and to highlight why, why we continue to focus on this type of compounds although the solubility was was not good and we had clear issues with the PK. Uh, as you can see here the three three different series the images of pyridazines in blue and um, the pyrazolopyrimidine uh, in, in orange um, sorry, the, the green one is also an imidazopyridazine. Uh, these three compounds were really active against all the stages of the parasite. Um, especially the compound in orange, it was uh, below 10 nanomolar for most of the, of the stages, the, the liver stage, the gametocyte, and um, the blood stage. So. That was something that was um, really exciting, and we wanted to see if we we could progress these these compounds further further, because if we could, it would be um, very valuable. So coming back at the way we try to improve the PK and the solubility, um, we tried to use. Um, what we call here the sulfoxide strategy by replacing the sulfone on the right hand side by a sulfoxide um, in the with the hope of improving solubility and therefore exposure. So uh, the first example is with the imidazopyridazine uh, with the sulfonide the cyclopropyl sulfone on the right hand side and the second example is with the um, uh, pyrazolopyridine um, and we decided to also put a cyclopropyl sulfone on the left hand side as we know it could boost the activity. Uh, one of the reasons we, we focused on the imidazo, the pyrazolopyridine series on the right is um, because the HERG activity um, was, um, was there was no HERG activity and 
it was we wanted to see if it if it was compound uh, dependent or if it was true for this for the whole series and <laughs> since we had problems with other type of compounds in the imidazole pyridazine uh, series we found it was really important to um, to investigate the pyrazolo pyridine series for that matter. So I'm going to start with the first example here of the imidazole pyridazine series. And um, what you can see straight through to on this, on this slide is that the sulfoxide is almost as potent as the sulfone compound, which means that the this, the parent compound is almost as active as the metabolite because the sulfoxide is going to be metabolized into the, sulf into the sulfone. What is so clear is that solubility unfortunately didn't improve um, by putting a sulfoxide. But uh, even if the solubility didn't improve, um, in vivo efficacy was really good at 4 times 50 and cure was achieved. Um, we had three mice out of three that were cured at this dose. If you look at the rat PK, we also see that the bioavailability, um, the total bioavailability combining the metabolite and the parent compound uh, went up to 47% compared to 24% for um, the sulfone compounds by itself. So uh, having a sulfoxide uh, helps to improve uh, exposure of the sulfone um, into the blood. Um, if you, um, the second example I'm going to talk about now is the um, pyrazolu pyridine scaffold. And we used exactly the same strategy, and we had exactly the same results. Um, the parent compound, the sulfoxide, was as potent almost as the, the sulfone. Solubility didn't improve in this case either. And we also achieved cure in the, in the P. Berger model with um, three mice out of three uh, that were cured. Uh, so we decided to. We didn't run the rat PK for this compound, and we, we decided to, to go straight away into the skid mouse model to see what, um, what we were going to obtain. And um, it was also very active uh, in the skid mouse model with an ED90 of 0.5 milligram per kilogram. And the AUC to, to achieve the ED90 was, was re reasonable. Um, I mentioned earlier that one of the reasons why why we used and why why, why we continue to investigate the pyrazolopyridine scaffold was because there was a lack of herg activity with with one of the compounds. So uh, we put the sulfone analog into the herg assay, but unfortunately. Um, it didn't translate for, for the series. It was apparently just compound dependent. So we we made a lot of compounds in, in this series and one of the one of the things we really need to we really needed to improve on was, was the herg activity and we couldn't find any clear trend and determine what um, what moieties would would help us to to improve on HERG. So unfortunately, um, we had to discontinue this series, and we didn't take it uh, further for late, late, late. So I'm gonna just summarize here um, what I just said on this case, and uh, then you you will be able to ask some questions if you want. Um, so. All the series um, related to the imidazopyridazine scaffolds were very active in vitro. Um, they, they were also they gave us also very good activity in vivo in the Piberge and skid mouse model. Uh, solubility in HERG were, were very um, 
how to improve and even with the latest compounds, um, the sulfoxide examples, we, we didn't manage to really improve on solubility and only one compound was um, not active against HERG. The, uh, the sulfoxide strategy allowed us to, to get good in vivo efficacy and to improve exposure in the, um, in the rat and to get good bioavailability. Uh, but as I just said, uh, oh, the fact that we didn't manage to to improve HERG um, and that the the lack of HERG activity for for one of the the pyrazole pyridine compound did not translate for more active compounds just led us to discontinue this series and to publish on it. So on this, if anyone has any questions. Thanks, Claire. If you have any questions, can you type them into the box? Um, and I'm sure Claire will be happy to answer them. Um, I, I have a quick question. So when you were choosing your original HIT series compound, you avoided the um, amino thiazoles. Was that because you knew that they were Payne's compounds? We did. Um. Oh, we actually did some work on it, um, mm -hmm. and we could have presented that case as well. Oh. But, <laughs> so, um, so this yeah, is another we, case of something being flagged as a pain, but actually being completely tractable. Um, no, we we did some. We did some work on it, and um, there is a few public publications. I think two or three uh, it was published, probably in 2014 and 2015. I could send some. I could send some references if you'd like. Thank you. I think the main conclusion um, from the the limited work we did do on the series is that um, the SAR was was very very flat. They um, although they might look like like a paint compound, and um, yeah. yeah, you would think um, some of the an analogs would be active as well. Um, there was only like a handful of analogs that really showed potent activity against the parasite. Okay, well, perhaps they were then. Perhaps that is the definition of a paint compound. Mm. Interesting. Do you have any questions from the floor? No. Just a quick question about your reduced compound. It was less active than the than the fully aromatic compounds. Do you think that was due to the difference in pKa of the nitrogens? I'm not. I'm not really sure, but um, it was definitely an interesting compound to make. Yeah, we wanted to see if the um, bringing an electron donating group would improve solubility or. Um, the re if the reduced scaffold would would be not as flat as the aromatic scaffold yes, to I see if it would be improved. But it didn't. No, it didn't. Did, did you make any efforts to calculate solubility for these compounds? Sorry, what, can you repeat the question? Did you make any, any attempts to calculate solubility for these compounds? Um, to uh, to predict we, it before you made made compounds. We didn't have any um, software at the time that could give us um, prediction on solubility, so no, we didn't do that. Okay. I ha I have I have a quick poll for everybody else to answer, just to see. Uh, 
what sort of things you're involved in. So I'll put this up. Um, it's just for the attendees only, so Claire, you can't answer. <laughs> let's see, let's see what we get as answers. And uh, and going forward, I think you can uh, you can probably use your computer mouse if you want as a pointer if you want to. Brilliant, yes. Here we go, we've got 93% of people online have voted. Any more? Let's see what the results are. I'm going to close it now. There we go. And share results. There you go. Yes, currently. <laughs> so I can see why, and see why everybody tuned in today. <laughs> I hope you're picking up some good pointers from this. But please feel free to ask questions. Okay, shall we go on? Uh, where are we? So, Tanya, you're going to take over now, yeah? Sure, yes. So, um, I will take you through the second case study, um, which is the work we've done on the amino proteins, um, uh, which transformed into pyrazine series. Um, and as Claire already described, um, we started off with having some hit compounds from our high throughput screen. Um, and in the case of the aminopyridine series, if we look at um, just the high throughput screening um, um, EC50 activities, they weren't as potent as the series that, that Claire just went through. But for us, they still look like um, good starting points in the light that um, they still had sub micromolar activity against the parasite, um, and they did not have any associated cytotoxicity observed with them um, in the, the information we gained from the high throughput screen. So we decided to start investigating these, these scaffolds a bit further. Um, and I think, as you would have detected from what Claire presented, is that with, with basing a strategy on phenotypic optimization, you really um, you don't have a target to guide you through what your chemical landscape needs to look like to get to, to get active compounds. It's something that you actively have to probe through the chemistry that you do. Um, with some of the strategies that people might have heard of, like um, you know, like using something like the Craig plot or, or the to or like a topless decision tree to to help you to um, assess what the, the chemical space sort of around your core scaffold needs to look like um, to steer you in, in in the right direction. Um, so we went went on um, about doing this, um, and in this instance, um, we see some of the, the things we assess, and, and as also like Claire described, it's um, what what's on the slide is, is by no means extensive. Um, but one one slight difference that we took in in optimization of this series is we pretty much at any point kept kept the three position substituent fixed while investigating so the five position substituent and, and vice versa. So um yeah um, not so much the grid that you that you saw in, in on clear slide. You can enter as an Apologies we have a um, a bit of a technical issue. Just see if we can fix that. Okay, excellent. We can continue. Um, apologies for that. I'm not sure exactly what went on there. Um, so, as I mentioned, um, not quite not quite the grid of activities that you saw in in, in Claire's presentation, but um, like a collection of compound that would help us to know what would be allowed and not allowed um, in the in the three and the four position around the scaffold. Um, with having all the screening data from the biofocus libraries, we have all these analogs around a central scaffold. Um, you start off by having a hypothesis of basically what your pharmacophore is going to be, um, and we try to keep that fixed. In our case, it was this, this central amino pyridine um, with the exploration around the down. So um, just having a glance in, in some of the things that we observed, um, obviously at the three position, be able to see that um, uh, sort of the more non-polar type of electron withdrawing groups 
Big on a phenyl substituent was, was quite well tolerated. Um, if we look just at the power position, there was also some polar electron withdrawing groups that were tolerated. Di substitution was allowed. Um, we could get away with um, three pyridyls um, to that 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 generally offered us some improved activity. Um, when we just had a heterocycle like a pyridine or other heterocycles, we tend to get quite a drop in activity. Um, and if we decide to link that three position substituent through either amine or amide, it's not shown on this slide, but that was not allowed. That was not allowed either. So that that caused quite a significant drop in activity. Um, when we look at the five position, um, similarly we could sketch out kind of what our chemical space for activity needs to look at look like. Um, for the five position, very much para substituent, that para substitution on a phenyl group that was best, especially when it's a polar electron withdrawing group, that tended to be optimal if it was like amides or sulfones. Um, if we have meta substitution of that uh, electron withdrawing group, um, it was detrimental to activity, but very significant drop. Um, um, and then also when we went to some heterocycles in general, um, they were not as well tolerated as the substituted phenols. So two other things that we also investigated um, is, um, like we, you start out with a hypothesis then of, of this, say, four protein being your pharmacophore and quite essential to activity, but it's also necessary to prove that at some point. So we went on and we, we made a range of substituents on that amine. I've also changed it to alcohol, alcohol removed it completely, um, and we determined that the primary amine is quite essential to activity. Um, likewise, we investigated the, um, the pyridine core, um, swapped it to various bicycles um, and also um, various other heterocycles. Um, and one thing that we, we clearly observed is that, um, in general, we, we got an improvement in activity when we um, swapped it from a pyridine going to an like, aminopyrazine compound. Um, so at this point, there were kind of two series that evolved for us. Um, there was the aminopyridine series, um, and um, the aminopyridine scaffold did continue to down the pathway to, to give us um, like a clinical candidate in the end, um, although um, um, in the in the publications one can read up on about that, but I will not go into detail about that today, um, as I think there's, there's more things that we learned from from the further optimization of the amino pyrazine series um, and some better examples and illustrations about our thinking um, and our strategy around our further optimization. Um, I right think so. If, um, with the switch, all the compounds that you'll see would now be the amino pyrazine compounds. Um, and uh, what we found, and and what we could detect from the SIR, um, if we sketch the landscape, is that the substitution of the two positions and the structure activity relationship around that transferred um, completely between the amino pyrazine and the amino pyrazine series. So there's a lot of information already that like we had in hand um, going to the amino pyrazines. Um, so first of all, um, looking a bit more at um, the other properties um, and the structure property profile of these amino pyrazine compounds, um, and you can clearly see that obviously on the on activity front, we're looking at fairly low nanomolar activity, and like I mentioned before, and something that transferred already from the high throughput screen is that these compounds were not cytotoxic, which is a big plus, um, and. Because this was a general trend, um, we did not put every single compound um, that we synthesized up against our um, cytotoxicity screen in the in the Chinese hamster ovary cells. Um, these compounds um, were in, like, in general really stable if we looked at um, the human microsomal stability data. Um, but two things that that stood out to us that we realized we, we need to keep an eye on and we need to improve on, um, again, was, was solubility. Um, if you can see all the values highlighted in red, um, across the board, the solubility um, is not in every case in every case optimal. Um, you can see when when we have a, a sort of the primary amine, sort of the amino protein substituent um, on, this, on the three position there, the solubility does improve. Um, um, but we could see a slight drop in activity going going along with it. 
Um, so, the Julie for us, um, there's a, the, two, the two things that we, we would like to, to work on, um, and in a, in a matter of priority, we prioritize solubility first, um, and then secondly, keeping an eye on, on what the Herg activity would be. Um, for us, um, we would like activity greater than 10 micromolar, um, and those within the two parameters that we focus on. Um, what we can also see on this slide is, um, in, the, in general for the series, although I mean, solubility is not optimal. Um, these, these compounds are very potent, and um, they're not cytotoxic. So we did put them, um, put them straight into the p bergii efficacy model, um, and in all cases, um, with a four times ten mix per keg dose, um, we got quite high parasite reduction. So um, apart from that, um, actually the the amine that actually had the good solubility, um, all the rest of the compounds at greater than 99% parasite reduction, which is a big plus for these compounds, um, although solubility was still something that we would like to improve on. Um, so if you just go, um, go back to when we basically right at the start um, and investigated our structure activity sort of landscape around the central core, um, um, like I said, it was very clear to us that um, polar electron withdrawing groups on that five position for us was quite optimal for activity. Um, and during our SLR, by no means we have, have we explored that to the full extent. So um, from having that sort of knowledge, um, we, we set our path um, and um, as a best option to see if we can improve solubility by, by modifying this position where we know polar substituents are allowed. Um, yeah, so you can see we went, we went on and then um, synthesized a range of, of amides with quite polar groups on them um, yeah, to see what that brings about for solubility. Um, and that is a strategy that uh, worked fairly well for us. Um, so now you can see where we went from some, in some instances, solubilities of um, less than five micromolar. Um, in this instance, um, solubility being quite improved, um, more towards the sort of double-digit micromolar, micromolar solubility and, and above. Um, we decided to keep sort of our three-position substituent fixed so that we just have a clear assessment on um, what the impact of the various changes are going to be rather than changing two things in the molecule just once at once, just have matched pairs across um, um, to, to have a view on, on the solubility. Um, these amides are also, those amide substituents are also quite microsomally stable. Um, and um, along with this improvement of solubility, um, I think because of that introduction of the more polar functionality in the molecules, often um, you could see that. Also, we had an improvement in, in our HERG activity with all these compounds being above um, our 10 micromolar cutoff that we set ourselves. What we can also see is that um, these compounds now have even slightly more improved primary activity against the, the, um, the sensitive cell line. I just quoted the, the sensitive cell line. Um, IC50 there, um, and I have to apologize to just notice there's actually a mistake on this slide. Um, the the EC50s are in nanomolar, not non micromolar, so my apologies for that. I didn't pick that up earlier. Um, but for all these compounds now, we, we challenged it in the P. Burgia efficacy model at four times three milligrams per kilogram. Um, and again, for quite a number of these compounds, we, we got higher than 90% um, parasite reduction in the model. Um, although these compounds did not offer us a complete cure, the, the parasite reduction for us was very positive, um, given that we only had a 3 mx per keg dose, or 4 times 3 mx per keg dose. Um, so um, because these compounds were so active, we wanted to also see what they would do in the humanized skid mouse model, which will then be infected with the Plasmodium falciparum um, parasite, which infects just a human parasite that infects humans, um, and alongside that, get a clear assessment of what the pharmacokinetics will be. Um, so for, for the compounds that performed best in the P. Bergia model, and those are the ones that went into the, the P. Valsiprim skid mouse model, um, and for all of the compounds 
we got um, ED90s of um, less than a meg per keg. Um, so really quite potent compounds as well. Um, and that, um, for some of the compounds you can see, is direct translation from um, really good efficacy that a really good exposure that we've obtained. So if you look at the RAT PK, um, sort of for the compound on the far left in the middle and, and then the far right, you would see that our half-lives are, are really long, um, our bioavailability is, is quite good, and some, in some cases more than 90% and then bioavailable. And, and, um, and that also directly correlated with, with the in vitro data um, especially the microsonal stability that predicted these compounds um, will, will be stable. And um, so our in vitro and results transferred to in vivo um, by having the good PK. This is two instances where you can see um, uh, in the case where we have again um, the, the primary amine, the second compound from the left at 666A10, where our bioavailability was not very good. Um, and then um, also, um, the compound, sort of second from the from the right hand side, um, yeah, we we suspect that that might might break down a bit more easily. Um, but likewise, that, that smaller really polar group also enforced um, not such great bioavailability. So, taking this data and in, in, in combination, looking at the rat PK and um, which compound really, which compounds really had the good PK? Um, there were obviously the three compounds that, that clearly stood, stood out, sort of towards the left, the middle, and the right hand side compound. And those are the compounds that we decided to um, see what they would bring in against the life cycle stages of the parasite. So you know, we have this really potent blood stage activity, um, and in our case, um, we were really happy to see that. Um, in, in the two instances, this really good blood stage activity did transfer to the liver stage and to the, to the gametocyte stages as well. Um, so you can see the, the, that would be the compound in blue and the compound in green. Um, if you look at the compound in, in orange, and um, that is an acid, it had really good blood stage activity, but um, as soon as we get to some of the exerotricidic stages, the liver stage and the, the sexual parasite, um, you can see that the activity activity drops quite a bit, um, um, and we haven't investigated fully, but we believe that there might be um, some permeability issues with this acid getting into some of the liver cells where the parasites would reside, um, and um, sort of in general getting getting into the parasite where we know the different life cycle stages would. Um, um, would look morphologically would would look different and would have different um, penetratable properties. Um, so another question that came up at this stage, I mean, these compounds really look good in terms of their pharmacokinetics and um, and in terms of their efficacy um, and at a good translation between what what the in vitro assays translated to and the in vivo assays, that it did spur the question of of what these compounds' mode of action would be. Um, so the two avenues we took for determining the mode of actions were um, in collaboration with, with Columbia University, David Fidoff's group, and also with um, uh, Salzome, which is part of JSK, um, to do resistance generation and sequencing. So uh, looking at um, what would be a cause of resistance against these compounds, and then also do some chemoproteomics at Salzome work to get pulled down in competitive binding experiments. Um, and in both these instances, um, it pointed towards um, the PI4K gene for being um, not only the mechanism of resistance, if, if there are mutations in that gene, um, but also um, basically the target. So in this instance, the, the mode of resistance and the target correlated. Um, quite well. And that got backed up by some functional enzyme uh, data um, with uh, actually the Plasmodium vivax enzyme, a transgenic enzyme was expressed and we could assay against that and the activities correlated quite well um, across multiple compounds from the series and we were pretty confident that um, through these uh, three different avenues all pointing towards PI4K that we were Pretty confident that 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 is the mode of action of these compounds. 
Uh, so then, just as a summary, um, again, just thinking back um, and to, to the goal of our, of our program and trying to keep that always in the forefront of, of what you're trying to do, um, we wanted some compounds that would be useful in, in the treatment of Plasmodium falciparum and Vivax malaria. Um, we, yeah, we managed to get compounds that, that show really good efficacy and, and that could progress towards those lines. Um, then these compounds, obviously, along a last screening cascade, we kept on checking that they not cross-resistant um, to get against uh, the drug-resistant cell lines, um, and to ensure that, that we have compounds that's that's uh, active against all the resistant and non-resistant cell lines. Um, and we were very happy to also see that these compounds are actually quite potent against some of the liver and then trans transmission blocking. Um, crucial stages of, of the parasite life cycle, so the liver stage and the and the gametocyte stages. Uh, in total for this, this series, in, in in trying to assess it, we probably synthesized about 100, 110 or so compounds. Um, and through our learnings and, and early SAR um, and applying our learnings to, to our later um, problems with solubility, we, we managed to get compounds that not only have good in vitro potency, but also um, having that translated into good in vivo efficacy by by means of also having compounds that have that good pharmacokinetics. Um, so, just sort of in, in a nutshell, this is obviously not um, um, and not something that we optimize for. But these compounds did go further um, into some of the, the off-target panels and um, in vitro and in vivo toxicity studies. Um, and for the amino pyrazines, um, it's um, it all went well, and we managed to to get a preclinical candidate approved um, from the series. Um, yeah, so that that just probably just before we take some more questions, um, just lead me to put on an acknowledgement slide just to say that all the work you are seeing is, is not um, just as a result of, of, of Claire and I presenting it today, but obviously a, a really big team. Um, behind it and lots of collaborations that resulted um, in, in this work being done. Um, and I'll, yeah, I think we can take some questions. Hello? So okay, I need to. I I muted myself. <laughs> right. So we have a question from uh, Eamon Comer at the Broad Institute. He said, have the presenters looked at other cardiac iron channels, such as sodium and calcium channels, and also has the compound, have the compounds been submitted to AIMS testing uh, and human kinase panel testing? <laughs> There's quite a few, quite a few points there. Do you want to start with the the channels? Yes. So for um, for the compounds that that really looked good in vivo and that um, was void, obviously we, we screened against herd activity first. The compounds that was void of herd activity and that um, looked really good in the in vivo efficacy models and um, we, we saw as front runner compounds, those went into the potassium and sodium and calcium um, iron channel packages um, at, now I can't remember exactly, the CRO, I mean we outsourced it to the CRO and I think it was Essen that, that did that work for us. Um, and um, they were they they had really good margins to, um, over all those over, over all those iron channels. Um, yeah. So for off-target toxicities, yes. So we looked at um, both lipid kinase and then so human lipid kinase and just human protein kinase panels. Um, and um, they, yeah. I mean there were a few. You see a few kinases that that was flagged in in the initial just single point uh, screen. Um, however, when we took that to IC fifties, um, we still had quite good margins. Um, so probably more than like a hundred fold margins on on those human kinases um, as well. Uh, Ames testing your Ames came back five strain Ames came back as uh, as not being an issue. Um, yeah. Also, the micronucleus assays came came back as as being negative. So, for the for our most promising compounds that we saw that we had 
yeah, I mean, really good efficacy and really good PK, and um, the compounds that got us really excited also because of all the um, extraeurotocytic and um, life cycle stage activities, and um, those we did full optimization, I mean, full profiling on. Thanks, that's a very full answer. Uh, there's another question here from Beatrice Baragana, who says, uh, have you used Pampa to profile for permeability? Um, at the time, uh, no. Um, what we did do also with, um, with selected compounds going forward is we did use a CRO to, um, to get CACO2 permeability data on these compounds. Um, you're here, um, you're busy, maybe just a bit of background. So, I mean, our project um, is nestled within a university setting. Um, so we do not always have access to like all the um, ACME assays, and especially when we did this specific work, did not have access to all the, the ACME assays, obviously, that we probably would have liked to. So a lot of the work we had to outsource and um, um, and be quite quite selective in terms of which compounds we choose to, to for instance, get CACO2 data on. Um, yeah, things here with us changed changed a bit um, and we managed to now set up a PAMPA assay um, here at the university. So at this stage for our more current projects, PAMPA permeability is more routine assay for us. Um, and so far what I could say is that um, like in the current series we are working on, um, they seem to be a fairly, the, for the examples we have so far, they seem to be a fairly good correlation between the PAMPA permeability we've seen and the, um, the pharmacokinetics um, that we've seen. Obviously, I mean, PAMPA um, is just, um, I mean, it's an artificial membrane. I don't think you'll get as much information out of it as you would with CACO2, um, especially not if your compounds are maybe really basic and tends to bind to phospholipids maybe. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a good basis. Thanks. And I guess also that was kind of a retrospective way of doing it because you were testing in a phenotypic assay. Yeah? Um, yes, yeah. yeah. Although I do believe uh, when we look at sort of the more liver stage and maybe gametocytes stages of the parasite life cycle, I think more permeability data probably in hindsight would have been um, quite valuable, quite valuable um, to us. Yeah. Interesting, yeah. So Beatrice also says, did you identify the target in time to apply structural techniques for optimization? Um, unfortunately, unfortunately not. No. <laughs> and also, did you use ortho substituents to explore rotation of the rings? We did. We tried some big methyl and fluoro substituents. Um, it, it, our SIR didn't, didn't allow for that. So we had quite significant drops in activity when, when we tried to implement that. We're flooding in at the moment. So we uh, have a question here from Jadel who says, do you routinely use multiple species microsomes during hit to lead and lead opt or just human liver microsomes? Um, no, so we, we probably would, uh, currently we routinely use um, human, rat, and mouse, um, and the reason for that being that our, our in vivo efficacy is done in mouse, um, and usually the pharmacokinetics um, we mostly have access to is done in rat. So yeah, I guess you would have seen from our presentation we show the rat pharmacokinetics and then the, the in vivo efficacy is in mice. Um, so for us it is really handy to have the microsomal stability in, in mice, rat, and then human, obviously, we, that means we want to make a treatment for human. Um, but um, in terms of correlating in vitro and in vivo, in vivo data, it's valuable to, for us to also have the mouse and the rat stability data. Okay. Well, I think as we've, as we've gone over the hour, um, we'll draw th things to a close here. I need to give a, give a huge thank you to both Claire and Tanya for going through such an amazing project, a um, huge amount of information there. Uh, if you want to review what they were talking about, then the, we have access to the recording, uh, and I will put it up onto YouTube, and you will all receive a link to the recordings to 
so you can look at it at your leisure afterwards. So thank you once again um, for attending. Uh, keep an eye out for next month's webinar. I uh, look forward to seeing as many of you as possible then as well. Oops. And now I'm going to close the webinar.